Just weeks after the end of the Korean War, a North Korean fighter pilot escapes that oppressive regime and delivers a Soviet fighter jet to the Americans. Welcome to the Mimi Gerges Show. After World War II ended, the Soviet army occupied the northern half of Korea. Stalin wanted to install a puppet leader and picked Kim Il-sung. Now, some 65 years later, Stalin's gone, the Soviet Union's gone, and North Korea is still a Stalinist dictatorship. Kim Il-sung's grandson, Kim Jong-un, rules the closed nuclear-armed state with an iron fist. But back in 1953, there was this young North Korean fighter pilot, No Kum Suk. All he dreamed about was living in the U.S. One sunny morning on a routine flight near the South Korean border, he made a run for it. He landed his Soviet-made MiG-15 jet in South Korea, delivering it to the Americans. Nokum Sook's American name is Kenneth Rowe. He joins me in the studio, along with Blaine Hardin, who's written the story in a book called The Great Leader and the Fighter Pilot. Welcome to you both. Hi. Blaine, I want to start by understanding the character of Kim Il-sung. He was born to Christian parents, and then he ends up being this narcissistic, rabid communist. What happened to him? Well, he became a, an anti-Japanese guerrilla leader uh, uh, in bordering China. He moved there when he was seven years old. Uh, he left C- the Korean Peninsula and went to China. Because the Japanese were controlling... They controlled the Korean Peninsula, and they also cr- controlled that part of China. He grew up as a, uh, an anti-Japanese uh, um, zealot, and he was influenced by the Communist Party in China. Uh, which was also fighting against the Japanese. And at a very young age, he was expelled from school. He was ca- actually jailed when he was in secondary school for a year. And when he came out, he really turned into a communist-believing, anti-Japanese guerrilla fighter. And he was dynamic for a young person. He became the leader of the ethnic Koreans living in China who are fighting against the Japanese. And he also made some raids into the Korean Peninsula which made him famous, actually. And that kind of went to his head, and that's well, where the... Well, it, it did over time. His uh, dictatorial tendencies really didn't emerge until after he'd been in North Korea for a few years. He was a pretty effective guerrilla leader, and then when he came to, uh, as the, the Soviets' chosen puppet to lead North Korea, he, uh, could, he relied on the popularity that he had. He was famous. His name was known among many... Uh, Koreans because he'd fought against the Japanese. What they did not know was how young he was. They thought he was an old, gray-haired uh, statesman, but in fact he was in his early 30s, and uh, many Koreans who saw him for the first time when he was presented by the Soviets as the new leader, they simply couldn't believe it, and they laughed at it. But why did the Soviets pick him? I mean, he wasn't especially smart. He wasn't especially dynamic. They picked him for, for a couple reasons. They couldn't get the uh, the leader that they wanted because their, he wouldn't their first cooperate. Choice. <laughs> their first choice wouldn't cooperate, but he was uh, well schooled in the Soviet system. He had uh, become a captain in the Soviet army and had been educated in the Soviet system, so he was compliant. But he also had the ability to sort of sense what the Korean people cared about. It's a demagogic genius that he had, and it slowly emerged in the 40s, and he genuinely became popular. He, he reformed agriculture. He uh, sent people to school. Standard of living actually improved for many of the poorest North Koreans during his first few years in power. Kenneth, your early years in North Korea were very pleasant. Um, what did you know about America during that time? America always known in Korea to the Korean was a paradise. In fact, during the World War II, Japan oppressed that the U.S. is the enemy, so Koreans uh, 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 avoided the saying about the America. But on their heart, they knew that America is a great country, and we also, uh, from the time to time, we saw the Koreans came back from the United States, and they lived very well. They used to say that that's an American family. So always had a good feeling about the U.S. And the Koreans thought that someday, if they had an opportunity, called the U.S. That's what they always thought. But in Japanese time, 
they could not express because the U.S. was their enemy. So they just lived. As soon as World War II was over, this is wide open. People started reading the truth of the United States. So, so yeah. Kenneth, your father died when you were 17. Yes. Is that when you decided in your heart that you wanted to go live in the United States? No, before that. As soon as World War II was over, I was 13. My dream was to go to live in the U.S. someday. But I was too young, number one. Number two, in order to go to the U.S., I have to be at least in South Korea because the U.S. never recognized North Korea. So I was not even in South Korea. So I cannot go to South Korea at the age of 13. I have no means of uh, going to school or where to live or how to survive. So I didn't go there. But in my heart, uh, I would go to the U.S. at that time if I could. So when was the first time you saw Kim Il-sung, and what was your impression of him? Well, the first time I saw Kim Il-sung was 1948, when I was in the middle, middle school. And he came to give a speech at the uh, fertilizer factory, that's a big, huge uh, factory. And the workers who gathered there, and I was a student, I watched him give a speech. Good impression, even though I didn't agree with him. He was a communist, I was an anti-communist. But he was, a, they chose the right guy. He was a good-looking guy and a big guy and a lively and a great orator. And for the communist purpose, he was the right person. He gave a firing speech and people were shouting, and, oh, great leader. Uh, they were shouting the uh, slogans. So the only impression I got was when I saw him, he's the right guy for the Soviet Union. But I, I thought that somehow uh, that's my enemy because I'm an anti-communist. The book we're discussing is called The Great Leader and the Fighter Pilot, The True Story of the Tyrant Who Created North Korea and the Young Lieutenant Who Stole His Way to Freedom. Blaine Hardin is a best-selling author. He's in the studio with me, as is Kenneth Rowe, who is that young uh, lieutenant from North Korea. So, Blaine, what was Kim's relationship with Stalin? It was close. He idolized Stalin. He imitated Stalin more closely than any other satellite leader that the Soviet Union ever created. He wanted to be mini Stalin. He was a mini Stalin. <laughs> in fact, he 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 out Stalin Stalin in the end. Uh, he lasted much longer in power. Uh, he created concentration camps. He shifted the politi- the the population around based on uh, their perceived loyalty. He controlled information. He limited travel. He did all the all the plays from Stalin's playbook, uh, Kim Il-sung did. But he also got Stalin to give him enough money to invade South Korea and start the Korean War. But what did Stalin think of him? Stalin seemed to think that he was uh, probably nothing more than just one of the many uh, puppets that he had created. Uh, he served a purpose. He wasn't particularly uh, interested in, in North Korea or the well-being of the North Korean people. What Stalin was interested in and why he gave the, the nod for the Korean War is he wanted to torment the United States. He wanted to bleed the U.S. Treasury, and he wanted to uh, get the Americans involved in a war that would cost them a lot of lives. Even though Stalin didn't think it was a good idea for Kim to attack the South, China didn't think it was a good idea. Nonetheless, he did it anyway. Well, Stalin didn't think it was a good idea for some time. And then he decided in, the early, 19, in early 1950 that conditions had changed. And that those are the words that he used in a, in a diplomatic cable. And he believed that the Americans were unlikely to respond uh, to an attack on South Korea. So he was expecting us yeah. to just let it go. He had followed the, 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 sec- the U.S. Secretary of State at the time, had said that uh, the Korean Peninsula was not in the, the zone of, of uh, importance that would justify an, uh, retaliation by the United States. Um, but he calculated wrong. Uh, within a few weeks, a few days actually, of the invasion, uh, Harry Truman decided that this uh, aggression cannot stand, Mm -hmm. and the Americans came roaring in. What were you told, Kenneth, um, at the time, as a North Korean young man? What had happened? All I know is that uh, Stalin was afraid of the United States. Kim Il-sung wanted to invade. However, what happened was the Soviet Union armed the North Korean army ever since they entered North Korea. That's what we wondered, why they are building such a... uh, heavy army armed forces. 
only place they can uh, use those armed forces was invading South Korea. So they were preparing for invading. The question is when Stalin was afraid the U.S. might get involved. Until Secretary of State uh, Dean Acheson gave a speech in January of 1950 at the Washington uh, Press Club that uh, placed Korea outside of the U.S. De- defense perimeter. And then he... Uh, he saw that a, as a green light. Yeah, then he gave a green light. To, okay, go ahead. Uh, and uh, the U.S. will not get involved. But even today, the North Koreans think it was American aggression that started this whole war. Oh, that, yeah. yeah they, or they, uh, that the South, with the American help, had, had invaded the yeah. North. Before that, they had a border crisis every week. That's not a war, actually. A little bit of shooting at each other. But then uh, they say that the South Korean army invaded North Korea, and they uh, advanced one to two kilometers north of the border. That's when they uh, counterattacked. Then people wondered, how come if South Korean army invaded North Korea, they lose so quickly? So they mm-hmm. had a skeptic about the, what North Koreans were saying. And they were, in two days, the North, South Korean capital was gone. So people didn't believe in what North Koreans were saying, that the, who started the war. But they kept lying. So now all the North Koreans think that the South Korea started the war. Blaine, you said this in the book, quote, for a few days... Kim Il-sung was a military genius. Is that all? That's how long it lasted, his military genius? Yes, uh, for a few weeks. He had good Russian tanks that that were very effective, but he didn't have the supply capability to keep the tanks running. And the, the tanks and the army outran their supply lines, and within a few weeks, the Americans started to use air power. So he thought he was like a guerrilla leader again. Right. He was trained and he was effective as a, as a guerrilla leader running maybe 200 people. When he started to run an army of thousands, tens of thousands, over great distances, he was incompetent from the very beginning. And he, he, he basically lost his army and lost the war and lost North Korea. The Americans and the South Koreans marched quickly and, and occupied the entire Korean, Korean Peninsula. Then the Chinese decided to get involved. Mao did not want to fight the Americans or the South Koreans on Chinese territory. But when he saw that they were losing, he had to. He sent in hundreds of thousands of troops and over the next year fought the Americans to a draw. And the the war basically was a stalemate for much uh, much of the time that it was fought with no movement. The fight was really in the air. Blaine, the American Air Force started uh, bombing North Korean cities. A lot of civilians were killed. Why, why did the Americans do that? What was the purpose of that? Well, they did it in part because they could. Uh, they had, there were no air defenses on the there ground. Were no, the, there were really no air defenses for most of their missions over North Korea. They could fly mm-hmm. long, leisurely bombing missions. They had big mm-hmm. B-29 bombers and an unlimited number of bombs that could, they could mm-hmm. drop. And they were there. And they did it as a way of trying to break the will of North Korea. And it it did not have a whole lot of effect on the outcome of the war. They weren't really using those bombs to destroy the Chinese army, which was the the element on the ground that had turned the war. But they they bombed with conventional weapons, and then after the Chinese invaded, then they switched to conventional weapons and napalm. And in many cases, they burned the cities they had previously bombed. Another thing is that uh, you see, U.S. was still under the influence of the General Curtis Lee theory. He said, in order to win the war, we must kill the enemies. If we kill enough of them, they give up. So mm-hmm. when he was commanding the air fleet in Europe, he demolished the Hamburger and the Tristan. And when he was in the Pacific, he reassigned. He firebombed the Tokyo. But Kim Il Sung didn't care how many of his people died. He only cared about his own. Well, after he started the war, he cannot stop the war because the Soviet Union was behind. He could get the permission from him to stop. The war was out of his hands at that point. The Chinese were fighting on the ground, and Stalin was running uh, the the air war to to a large extent. Stalin did not care about North Korean deaths. Right. Mm -hmm. Kim Il Sung, I mean, he he did not want his population to be to be murdered by bombs. In fact, he did appeal to Stalin uh, two or three times um, to end the war, saying the suffering uh, is too great and the destruction of the cities is too great. And even 
Stalin still didn't care. The only reason the war ended was Stalin ended. He died in the spring of 1953. Then the Soviet Union said, enough of this war. And it soon, it, shortly after that, peace talks started. So, Kenneth, you actually um, were in a city that the Americans were bombing from the air. Yeah. What did was, you experience? Yeah, when I was a naval kid, I was not in the Air Force when war started. Then there was in Chongjin, the largest city in the northeastern part of North Korea, near the Russian border. I bombed by the B-29 twice. They just wiped out the entire city. That was the largest city there. And that's a typical uh, way of a carpet bombing. Lee May's uh, theory, kill as many people as possible so that the enemy wouldn't give up the... But couldn't the fighting. civilians have gotten out? Well, they dropped the leaflets. Leaflet doesn't drop there. You know, when the wind blows, you cannot find anything. And where they go, anyway? They can go to the mountains if they know. So they didn't know that the B-29 would come to bomb. Mm. But B-29 dropped the leaflets, I know. But, but after that, seeing that, did you still love the United States? Oh, yeah. The, I, my, I was thinking of going to the U.S. doesn't matter what happened to Korea because I don't want to get out of the North Korea, number one. Number two, come to the U.S. and educate here then think of what to do. <laughs> the book we're discussing is called The Great Leader and the Fighter Pilot, The True Story of the Tyrant Who Created North Korea and the Young Lieutenant Who Stole His Way to Freedom. Blaine Hardin is a best-selling author, and Kenneth Rowe is also in the studio with me. He is that North Korean fighter pilot. Can I just add one thing about the bombing? The bombing of civilian targets in North Korea was never really part of the way Americans understood the Korean War. The war was... Uh, a stalemate, and it was very unpopular in the United States. But the bombing of these cities was not part of the news coverage in general. But even in the aftermath of the war, when historians wrote about uh, the Korean War from the American perspective, the bombing has played a very, very minor part of, of our understanding of what happened. Not so in North Korea. In North Korea, the Kim family has used the fact-based narrative of that bombing as a way to legitimize their rule for the long term. What they say is, sure, it's dark, it's poor, it's isolated in North Korea, but we're protecting you from those Americans. And you remember that those Americans were the ones who killed your grandma. Mm. And they used napalm. They used a yeah. lot of napalm. Kenneth, you said that you survived really in the North Korean regime by pretending to be a good communist. What does that mean? What did you do? What did you say? Yeah, in order to be in the North Korean uh, military at the, uh, in a uh, responsible position, you have to show that uh, you can do something for them. One way would be uh, you participate in a propaganda war. You have to become a fiery speech giver. So I gave uh, lots of speeches denouncing the American imperialism and praising the North Korean dictator Kim Il-sung and the Soviet Union and then uh, carry out the party duties uh, faithfully, criticizing other members for not working hard enough. But how did that impact your personal relationships with other people? You know, there's no real uh, good relationship with others. As far as I knew, they were my enemies because I'm an anti-communist. In my heart, I'm number one anti-communist. So everybody I saw, they are all my enemies in my heart. But in the surface, I give a speech that I'm a best communist. So they believe in me. So I was rewarded by uh, medals uh, from time to time. And I gave uh, good speeches and uh, uh, read a message from Stalin and uh, other communist leaders. And also I was a very good pilot. So that made me a very valuable asset to them. So I was on their newspaper very often that they carry out their duties faithfully. You were a fighter pilot, and you, you got into dogfights, didn't you, with oh, yes. American yes. fighter pilots? Yes. What happened? In a dogfight, actually, you, see, you go with a big formation to go to the war zone, and then that's very confusing. I didn't like their tactics. You know, they should go to smaller groups so that you can fight more effectively. Their tactic was the larger groups, such as 24 planes uh, led by the squadron commander. We follow him. And then going to the wrong place, then they start attacked by the American planes. Then you fight against American planes. That's a very bad way of doing it. But what can I do? I, I have no voice. And their commanders were very uh, inexperienced. 
that's why they lost so many planes. And did you shoot down any American fighter planes? I, I fired at them, but I didn't uh, shoot down any. You but were I'm, hoping you wouldn't shoot them down, yeah, weren't you? Yeah, I'm glad <laughs> that I didn't shoot down because I was thinking of escaping during the war. So let's talk about that when you yeah. actually defected. So that morning you um, were sent up into the air just on a routine mission, but you happened to be close to the South Korean border. Yeah, that airport was uh, near the most southern uh, location uh, since the war was over. And our squadron was mostly experienced. So we were to deploy, deploy at the airport, most forward airport. And then they uh, asked us to fly so that they put in some more flying hours and so that we can be uh, combat ready. So I was a good pilot, so they told me that uh, today is Sunday, day off. Tomorrow, you take off first, one by one. Just fly around, doesn't matter, because we haven't flown plane for over a month. So we cannot be a combat mission readiness because without flying the plane. I thought that the, gee, this is a golden opportunity. I cannot miss this kind of opportunity. I was waiting for. So I was well prepared on Sunday evening. Okay, tomorrow I go. So my main mind was made up. Of course, my mind was made up after six, five, or even before that, if I see the right moment. And right moment means uh, I, have to, I have to ready to die if I fail. If I was afraid of my life, I can never escape. Yeah. Only chance I can succeed was about 20%. So I had to risk my life. But when I got to that forward airport, tomorrow I'm the first one to fly. Okay, I go. Doesn't matter what. If I fail, I die. So I didn't have any fear the following day. So I took off, went straight to the U.S. Air Base. Now, how did you not get shot down? By they're, they're the Americans, given already, that there's a MiG flying yeah. right over their airspace. Luckily, on that day, that morning, U.S. Air Base's radar was shut down for maintenance work. So they didn't have any radar on operational. So they didn't know. You came very close to dying yeah, yeah. by the Americans. So I was very <laughs> lucky. So when I saw the American planes near the American Air Base, uh, they were flying around slowly at the left side uh, they didn't give any attention to me. I thought that, gee, this is what's going on. So I just went down and landed with a downwind. Yeah. No, I didn't go from the other way. You almost because, hit a plane on the ground. Yeah, but I don't want them to see me, so straight down. Then another plane landed from the other side, so almost had a head-on collision. And that pilot was mad at me because he almost lost his, wife, his life. Yeah. I wanted to see him. I never chanced to see him. So you land. Yes. You get out of the plane, yes. then what? Then I taxi toward the uh, parking spot uh, away from the main runway. Then I saw the American plane lined up there. So I saw that one plane, you know, end of that the lineup, uh, I just went beside him and uh, parked and uh, jumped out. And then the pilot jumped out. He was sitting on the cockpit on alert, waiting for order to start the engine and take off. That's what alert means. He came out and uh, we met uh, between the two planes. Then we cannot do anything other than uh, just uh, shake hand. So I saluted at him for showing the goodwill. And yeah, shook hand, that's all we can do. You didn't know any English at the time? No, I, the English, yeah, I studied at the middle school. From 1948 on, they stopped teaching the English. So how did they react to you? I mean, did they know what to do with you? Did they understand that... Of this course, is a defection? Yeah, this course. is a North Korean giving us a MiG? Yeah, by then they knew that uh, this is a defector. They was pleased to see me. So I shook hands with uh, all those uh, F-86 pilots came out. Then none of the F-86 pilots came out. A couple of minutes later, entire airport personnel racing toward that spot. Car you also and, took out the picture of Kim Il-sung from yeah, your airplane. Yeah, I on the cockpit uh, and I smashed on the ground. You know, that, some, that was symbolic for you, wasn't it? Yeah, some crazy guy started that thing. And uh, you know, show the respect for our great leader. We should have uh, his uh, portrait in the cock, uh, instrument panel. That's why everybody had that. I thought that's a crazy thing. <laughs> so I took that out, grabbed it out, and after I got out of a plane, I smashed on the ground. What was the reaction in North Korea to your defection? Nothing. They said nothing. If they speak out, they lose more. They were embarrassed. So they, they were silent. They said nothing about uh, publicly. But, but they, there was some collective punishment. Oh yeah, they executed the five pilots. The, the, my defector, defector 
two years later, a pilot defected from North Korea told me that uh, they executed five MiG pilots. One was my best friend. They know that. Uh, they gave me, he told me that his name, unquestionably, he was executed. The other four. Just I'm because not, he was your friend? Yeah, my best friend. Kenneth, do you have any regrets? No, I don't have any regret. I'm so lucky that uh, I succeeded in escaping that place. Suppose I didn't escape at that time, I'm sure I'm dead by now because of food, bad food, bad health care, and my uh, unhappiness because mm-hmm. I'm an anti communist. I can have possibly lived this long if I have not escaped. So I'm very glad that I got out of there. No regret whatsoever. Blaine, is there any hope for the North Korean people? These kinds of regimes collapse. They've all collapsed. Um, but it's been so long. But, you know, it's been almost 68 years. Um, and it's lasted twice as long as any other totalitarian state in, in world history. And the conditions of its survival are intact. China wants a buffer between itself and a U.S. allied South Korea. And despite the uh, problematic behavior of the current regime with nuclear weapons, with sending cruise missiles out into the sea, um, with these constant threats against the world, China seems willing at this point to put up with the Kim dynasty running a buffer state for the foreseeable future. And until they stop doing that, we're stuck with them. Until China changes its policy, it's possible that, China, that North Korea could change under Kim Jong-un. There have been some reforms in farming practices, in economic behavior that's been relatively quiet compared to the noisy threats they make against the United States. But no significant changes. They're still running those prison camps. They're still running the They're prison starving camps. People. In fact, the borders of the country are more closed now than they were under Kim Jong-il, uh, the son of the great leader. The grandson, Kim Jong-un, seems to be very much in the mold of the grandfather. He looks like him, he dresses like him, and he is as vindictive as he was. He has killed, executed his own uncle. That's Blaine Harden, best-selling author. Also with me, Kenneth Rowe, who is a North Korean fighter pilot who defected in 1953. The book is The Great Leader and the Fighter Pilot the true story of the tyrant who created North Korea and the young lieutenant who stole his way to freedom. Gentlemen, thanks so much for being on the program. Thank you. Thank you.